My name is Harry Allen. My title is Hip Hop Activist and Media Assassin. I was born in Brooklyn and raised there initially until my family moved to Long Island, which they did when I was about eight years old. And I lived there pretty much for the next 20 years, about 20 years. And uh, we still have a home there. My family still has a home there. Uh, when I got married, I moved to New York City. I live in Harlem. I've been living in Harlem since I got married. Right. Well, how did you find like the hip hop movement or how did it find you? Well, um, I got into hip hop right around the time it was starting, I guess you could say, to um, be something young people would do. And uh, I just was immediately taken by it and with it. It was just something I connected to very strongly, immediately. And I think after realizing what it was, I became very aware that what I was experiencing was a vital form of culture that black people had produced. That was something that I became aware of pretty soon and pretty early. And um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how I became burdened with the idea that it was something that I had to document. But I think that the origins of that sense come out of my viewing a uh, piece uh, in which Bill Cosby was involved called Black History, Lost, Stolen, or Strayed. I saw this when I was pretty young. And in essence, it was a short TV special in which he talked about aspects or persons from black history who were little known but who had made significant contributions. And I think at that point in my life, this idea of history, and, and history I think has always been something to which I had a very strong connection, um, in part due to an emphasis on black history as I was growing up in the late 60s and early 70s, but also because being raised as I was and still practice as a Seventh-day Adventist, we've always had a connection to biblical history and to the past as being something from which we learn um, the activities and actions of patriarchs and prophets and others in the Bible is something that we don't consider stories or old stories or old tables or fables, but very real and very present um, and very meaningful. So I think that through that host of influences, I had a connection to history, to the idea of history, documented history and recorded history at a very young age, even if I wouldn't have verbalized it at the time this way. But somehow through that confluence, I became um, aware of the idea that hip hop existed, it was vital, it was new, and that I had to preserve it. I had to make sure that it s stayed around, that people understood it. So I think over time it was out of that conviction that I began to first take pictures of the things around me and then uh, document it as a writer. And it was through writing primarily that I, I guess, began to make whatever mark I may have made or get whatever recognition I may have gotten. Well, did, I'll jump forward to for a second and then jump back. Did that mean that that next step was how you ended up Media Assassin? Like, how did that title come about? Well, it was a, it was a title I made up, um, like all words are made up. And um, I took the title because of a... Um, dawning sense uh, that was layered over this other sense, I guess you might say. Um, a dawning sense of the hostility uh, with which black people were tr treated through media, symbolically, I guess you might say. And that media played a very high role in terms of the way people discussed issues, saw reality, saw themselves, saw others. And so 
the media scape, if you will, was um, was a place that to me was very real. It was a it was a, if you will, kind of like a, a war zone. And um, I've never said war zone before as a way of describing it, but I think that's probably pretty accurate. Like it was a it was a place of shadows, if you will, you know, and uh, of good and evil forces, so to speak. And so, um, as I began to write, I wanted to more describe my function as aggressive, precise. I wanted my words to not be innocuous, but I wanted them to be powerful. I wanted them to hit. Um, and I think that media assassin became a metaphor, a way of describing the effect I would most desirably want my words to have that they would it came kind of from the idea of responding to a written argument finding its weakest point and then hitting it there and then watching the entire argument collapse on itself which is um, really more I guess you might say a function of someone dealing with munitions than um, assassination but you know blowing things up is a very good way to kill as well. Sir, sure, well, did now, did this come from a sense of debate? That's why I want to go back into, like, your schooling and did did you go to college? I did. Did you? I went you, to Delphi University. Excuse me? I went to Adelphi University and in fact, that's where I met Chuck D and most of the other WBAU crew that ultimately became Public Enemy and the Bomb Squad. Oh, right on. The did you start as oh. okay? Let me back up with that then. Uh, did you start as a um, writer writing just for yourself, or did you like the the sense of writing and debate? And because there's a lot of people who like to write and argue, but not with precision that you're known for. So then, when you first started writing, who were your literary idols that kind of drove you in the direction of, okay, I need to be on point with this versus just where most journalism is kind of wildly throwing out its own opinions? Right. It's a great question, actually. Um, and what happened is that it came out of circumstance. It wasn't so much uh, idols or people that I looked up to, but it was circumstance. and. Um, I, I specifically took on the title at a time when I was in school. I had uh, transferred out of Adelphi and was taking classes at Brooklyn College. This would have been in the, you know, in the mid 80s. And there was a lot going on, obviously, or as many may remember in New York at that time, certainly racially, certainly whether it was, uh, it was right around the time of Howard Beach, in fact. And um, there was a lot of in the school paper debate over, you know, what was going on. Bernhard Getz uh, would be a little bit later. There was, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on in terms of opinion being expressed in the Brooklyn Kingsman, which was a paper that I had infili affiliated myself with at that time. And so I think it was there in the circumstance of people writing letters, uh, writing editorials, talking about race in this college and me feeling a need to respond that I developed that metaphor of assassin, media assassin particularly. It was on the basis of need, it was on the basis of understanding that I was in a, a small media environment, you know, a college paper at a college here in, in New York, but that there were, you know, a rate, a whole bunch of voices going against opinions that I held to be true, and so I had to you know, respond. Did, were you in an environment where it seemed like people were less than warm to receiving a pro-black message? Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, at that time especially, and really all throughout college, but especially at that time in Brooklyn, at Brooklyn College, 
uh, I, I, well, I, I, I don't know that I've ever been in any situation or circumstance where most of the people around me or of whom I was aware were welcoming to a pro-black message. It seems that the best a pro-black message can hope for is tolerance, you know, you know, it muted, muted distaste uh, uh, expressing itself as some kind of tolerance. That's the best that one can hope for, generally. Um, the people obviously closest to me um, were what you would call pro-black or nationalists or, you know, whatever, however one would define, you know, certain political views about black people in Africa. But I think the general environment, circumstance, certainly was, was hostile and remains hostile to those views. And certainly at Brooklyn College, you know, um, well, one had certainly a lot of black, mainly Caribbean black students there. There were uh, a lot of, I don't know what this term ethnic whites means, I've heard it a lot, um, but, uh, you know, white people of various uh, ethnic origins also sharing this space. And in administration, certainly, that was very white. And in a city that was very white and run by whites, in a country that's very white run by whites on a planet that's far less white but still run by whites and so against that you know local and global backdrop um, I was very aware that any views that I was expressing that were um, quote-unquote pro-black were going against the accepted norm do you think that well, that's interesting, too, about the, the Caribbean blacks. Like, so, because it seems that there's, the, that obviously Brooklyn has a large community of blacks that do not have grandparents here. Let's, let's put it like that, or even parents here. Like, you know, the, the parents sure. might have just Im recently immigrated here. So, you how did... You the borough of Brooklyn particularly? Yeah, in, in the that's borough of yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. I live my, in bed and that's, that's... My parents were, were some, for example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do, did, do you think that... I mean, because it's pretty obvious that, like, your average, even white liberal doesn't want to hear a pro-black message because they see it as anti-white or whatever, even if white people aren't even discussed, where you're literally talking about just the issues that are facing black people for some reason they need to put in the context of, well, it's not all, or whatever, but then to remove it out of that and to say, like, when you were right, when you first started writing, how did the black community take what you were writing? Or did you see a difference between, like, you know, blacks that were born here versus blacks that did, that weren't? I, I don't think that, at, at least at that school, I mm -hmm. don't think that, um, and again, the reason we're focusing on this particular school is, is that this is where, as I said, sure. this began to develop for me as a sense, you know, as a particular, I, I had hoped to write for the um, school paper at Adelphi, the Adelphian it was called, but never did. It was only when I transferred out to Brooklyn College that I began to be an active part and see the dynamics in and around of the school paper and uh, I don't think I really remember now my sense I remember reading things that I would write or publish in the paper and seeing the letters coming back and seeing varied you know responses I can't say that oh um, black people of West Indian descent felt this way and black people with roots in the American South felt another way. I don't remember it being differentiated this way. I remember it being very differentiated along so-called racial lines in terms of opinions about, you know, these statements. But um, I, it, it, it wasn't that fine a register that I was able to make about opinions. When you were, so when you were talking to people, did you see, did you, see, like, who responded when you were just verbally discussing this, these issues with people? Uh, that's a great question. Um, for the most part, I didn't. I didn't make it, it wasn't the type of thing that I would sit and have a conversation and talk to people and say, well, mm. how do you feel about, you know, Howard Beach or whatever. Uh, it was mostly something I would, I would kind of like, I would, you know, go to my classes or not and, uh, you know, read the paper and, you know, when it was time to write something, write something. 
you know. I, I'm, I'm sure, in fact, that the very first time uh, people saw, in fact, I know this, I know that the first time some people saw what I wrote, it was pretty shocking uh, uh, because I had been so, you know, um, I'm, even even now, I'm not a person to walk about and offer my opinions on things unless I'm asked, typically. Um, I remember turning in uh, one of my early editorials, and I haven't thought about this in years, actually, and one of the um, white editors uh, there, he said, um, Harry, I got your uh, article. Uh, can we talk about this? <laughs> I remember him, I just remember him now doing this. He asked me, and I, I think it was that he just wasn't expecting this because, you know, up to that point I was, you know, um, pretty much the go-along guy, I guess you might say. It was, it was only when this came out that it was just like, he's thinking in a way that I wasn't really expecting, you know. <laughs> so when, well, that's interesting. So then from, from writing and then people kind of seeing you differently and then as your name that as like Harry Allen started to carry more and more weight and that didn't really though happen until writing and particularly and it happened with different groups in different ways but it didn't sure. really happen until I started writing professionally and getting paid for it and then of course once Public Enemy said my name on a the record then it had another kind of life right but I mean like once for, from a personal level once you started seeing like that people were seeing you in a different way because you were obviously articulating yourself in your writing in a way that they weren't used to. When that's, was there a point when that started to register? And, and if so, then how did that change how you verbally discuss things with people? Because like if you didn't discuss things prior to then, and then you started to see like, wow, people are reading, like, you know, they go, they go and they read my writing. And then all of a sudden they're seeing a different Harry. So did that change or affect, how did that affect your public persona or your personal persona with people? Well, again, another great question. Um, I think what happened was that at the newsroom, and it's, it's so <laughs> odd that you're talking about this because um, this is just usually not a subject I usually, usually this part of my, my life gets completely glossed over because what people want to talk about is public enemy. And that's a very important part of my life and development. But there, a, 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 a very a lot of key things kind of happened um, in that short time at Brooklyn College. And what happened was that my relationships with people at this mostly white institution, there were black people at the, in, the, in the news office, but it was still mostly white people. My relationships became very, tense and standoffish. Um, I wouldn't say there wasn't any, you know, outward necessarily hostility or fighting or, you know, words, but it was, it was just, it got cold. It got very cold. It's what I refer to as hostility. <laughs> hostility <laughs> might be, um, depending on how you define that word, might be a good way of describing it. That people are very warm to you, but you can tell that there's a difference in the way that they're warm to you versus warm to others. There's not that there's a rudeness. It's not that somebody is talking bad about you or disparagingly you in any way. Just the idea that, like, you know, people now deal with you from a sense of distance and from a sense of now they're putting you in a box because you've opened your mouth and now they can categorize you versus the idea of creating their own opinion about you. And then because your own persona would kind of be a blank palette, then they can kind of put whatever they want on you versus like now you're using very bold colors and stuff and no longer can they just paint their own picture. Well, I'll say this. I'll say that uh, after I became more open and more aggressive uh, with my writing, my relationship with, I would say with most staffers there changed, and especially with the white ones, and that um, that 
it just got very quiet and I found myself at the news office a lot by myself. That's, that's kind of the way it felt. Like uh, my memories after that are pretty much a lot of time by myself there for one reason or another. Did you find, now at that point, you had already had your hub or the genesis of what would be Public Enemy was kind of, had already met because you had already met at Adelphi, that's right? That's correct. So as I guess the sense of alienation, which to me isn't odd from any black person that I knew that grew up or interacted, well, we'll get to the grow up in a second, but that interacted in, in mostly um, in areas where they were mostly the raisin in the sun, where they were the only one. When they reached the point of speaking out, mine was when I was like 13, 14. And right. then all of a sudden, people then start distancing themselves from you because it's just like, okay, well, I, I, first I thought, like, I could say, well, that guy was a nigger, but not him. He's different. But now he's, I'm not so sure about him. And that was well before the word nigger became fashionable, which I still find to be repugnant. But um, that's a different cup. <laughs> but did you find that the people that, the people within your hub, you kind of relied on them more or your energy as these other people pulled away, did you find yourself more engrossed in the pub, like what would be public enemy or just your friends in general? Um, I think at that time, one, I wasn't seeing those guys as much because I wasn't at the school and being at, going to Brooklyn College from, from, uh, from Freeport where I was living meant that, um, I was committing an enormous amount of time in the day to travel and being away, so I wasn't around them as much. I think what I relied on to a great extent at that point was myself. I think that I went more into my, my own thinking and my own thoughts. And certainly there are people I had you know conversations with and people I considered friends and whatever, but I think at that point a lot of it was me going into my own way of seeing things as opposed to relying on people saying, you know, I wrote this and they react this way and boy, it's not <laughs> something. It was really more just my own thoughts. And I think a, a lot of that also, I think a lot of this, um, you know, it's something I've, been, I've begun to think about. A lot of this comes out of the religion as well, out of my particular faith. I think that, um, I think that this idea of a person doing what is right even if they stand alone, it's a, it's a motif one sees repeated over and over again in the Bible. And again, if those aren't just stories or children's stories to you or fables, but are very present and real and thing, you know, individuals with which whom, whom you identify, whom you see as having personalities and subtleties of character, then you're going to respond to those stories in a certain way. You know, um, for me to uh, read the story of of um, Daniel's three friends uh, standing up to Nebuchadnezzar and being thrown into the fiery furnace is is like is that's the height of inspirational reading to me. You know, the story of you know Daniel revealing Nebuchadnezzar's dream to him. You know, uh, as Nebuchadnezzar you know sets out to kill all the wise men, the astrologers, and the soothsayers in Babylon. That's that's you know it's like when, when you know Daniel being thrown to the lion's den. I've mentioned Daniel three times already, but he's a, a real important figure to me. And so, like to me, he's not just someone distant or far away. That's like that's like you know um, he 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 means to me what I guess John F. Kennedy must mean to other people. You know, so that whole thing, the whole idea of standing by yourself because something is right is something that I learned very early and it came in very it came in uh, very early and remained with me and remains with me you know um, and has really become an important part of the way I work and how I work the way I work why I work did your I think I just lost your audio <laughs> <laughs> that 
Yeah, sorry. We uh, turn off the air conditioning in the skyscraper. It's like to save to save air conditioning, but then it turns into like you know a sauna. To, to save air conditioning. To save energy, oh, save you know, energy. so that way the the air conditioning doesn't run twenty four hours a day. It's like as soon as office hours are over, it's like okay, turn it off. The the, the building does it. Or, yeah. Or you, you building turns it off. Oh wow, energy saving, interesting. Yeah, hmm. they also turned it dim. All, more of the lights than that makes sense. Uh, than other buildings too, but it's sorry for the uncomfortable. No, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's actually not a, a big deal. I just, I was just, I just didn't want to sweat on camera. <laughs> <laughs> you, ready? you got your preacher, you got your preacher thing yeah, out there. I just think that's you know, a little nasty. Uh, um, did your, did you? Did your family have anything to do with that? Because I mean, very rarely does anybody really discuss like the family outside of drama. And to me, I like to think of like family, close friends more as like, what were these motivators, good or negative, to the idea of like, you know, you going in that direction. Like did, when you grew up, what was the area that you grew up in like? The area? Yeah, like where, where you grew up. Like what? Like what? Were, who were your friends? What were your friends like? Did you have a lot of friends that were like white, black, yeah. whatever? Like you know, yeah. religious. I think. I think. Um, well, I think a lot of. I think a lot of my friends were people that I knew from church, certainly. But certainly, a lot of them were also people that were in the neighborhood, wherever we were. Um. Certainly in my home, it wasn't a place where we had conversations about race or its impact or what it meant. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't a taboo subject at all. But it was, it was one that that I don't think really. My I don't I don't I think I think um, I think a, a racial conscience was something that my parents, as immigrants, uh, had to learn in this country, and um, I think that's so. I think they spoke. From their ambitions and their optimism, you know, and uh, try to get their children to be decent, you know, God-fearing people, you know, uh, and hope and, and perhaps they succeeded. Um, but a lot of that other information about the mechanics of white supremacy, I had to learn through reading, through thinking, through you know talking with other people, through you know conversations, lectures. All the various ways that one, you know, begins to acquire these inklings, you know. Did did your friends create any kind? Like, in other words, when you were young, did were they infused with any kind of, of for lack of a better term, uh, consciousness? about like you know the black I guess I, I'm really interested in how you came to that experience of like you know going like be like going from kid in this neighborhood to or kid period to Harry Allen that everybody knows as like this legendary black journalist and I always hate saying black journalist because, like, you know, the pen. Uh, well, I, I just don't, I don't necessarily like the term, but not because, like, it's not to be identified as black. It's just the idea that, like, you know, it would be great if we could eventually get to some time when, like, we will fast forward to um, uh, eventually to... Being um, judged by the content of our character? Yeah, well, that, but in other words, like... Where nonfiction then makes sense to people, where your show, like, because like your show doesn't necessarily identify, and and I know I jumped forward a little bit, but I want to jump back to that, but because nonfiction is, it could be it could be a show that's done by anybody. It doesn't necessarily need to be done by a quote black person. When you're listening to it, it's not like this rings out that is done by a black person. I had a but, white woman say that to me. If you were, but if somebody's paying attention, they will understand what informs the questions that you're asking and the topics that you address. But that doesn't. But so, how? What was that journey like? Getting from point A to point B, 
Like, did you do you see yourself as different people? Like, if you viewed yourself, if you as the adult looked at yourself as the child, what would the difference be between the two? If you were having the conversation with each other, well, I think I was brought up in a, a kind of. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't grow up the way a lot of black people did or do in various ways, and, and by that I mean. Um, I don't have any memories of being chased home from school by the, the you know the local white bullies, you know, calling me epithets or throwing sticks or anything like that. I, I, I think I grew up in a kind of of generally race neutral, quote unquote, unquote unquote, um, uh, environment, uh, suffused with the occasional crazy. Unclarity. Uh, uh, the 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 thing that that if you're a black person jumps out at you for some reason as markedly unfair or or not making sense unless you add race to the equation and everyone says well that's what's going on. So so um, I think it was dawning really. I think it was um, I think it was being in. Brooklyn first as a child um, when before we moved to, to Long Island and and going to school with black people you know and being around black people and hearing you know black uh, ideas and you know black history month and stuff like that and then going from that to a white elementary school where if that was done it was you know a little a little a little bit of it, but far less of it. Mostly white students, some black students. It was being in the seventh grade when Roots came on. You know, mm. it, it was it was it was you know it was um, seeing like it is. I, mean, I think my experience. I think that um, I think that I think that for most I think for most black people. You are strongly encouraged not to think about race or to announce it, to not to declare it, not to say that it's present, it's around, it's all enveloping. You're, you're, you're encouraged to just smile and keep moving. And one's life is some form of management where you either manage that experience and make sure that you keep doing that or you fail to resist the fact that it's chipping away. The reality is chipping away from the experience you'd like to be having. So you'd like to imagine that you can go anywhere, do anything, say anything, be anything, but you acquire a pocket full of slights. <laughs> And you never know where it's coming from or when it's coming from. It, it makes your existence a bit random in that way and a bit tense. And so it, eventually you either say, I'm going to open myself up to this and embrace the fact that it's happening. Or I'm going to shield myself from this and pretend it's not happening. And I'm going to keep doing that as long as I can. Either way... It's happening, mm -hmm. and either way, you're experiencing it, but your response to it is different in one mm -hmm. situation than it is in another. And I think, speaking for myself, mm -hmm. that I became the person who decided to embrace it and open myself up to it, and to declare it, and to talk about it, and to not do so relentlessly and all the time. You know, I I much rather not think about racism or the subject. I'd, I'd rather just be able to go, you know, lie in a pool, you know, but um, then I would, I would be creating a whole other kind of tension in my life, a whole other kind of tension, you know, that um, is very, you know, that would be not palatable to me, palatable to me. Well, and, well, that's interesting because even by answering the question, you kind of showed what you, the difference was between, because I think from the way that you talk about you as youth, the youth would have seen it as more palatable, palatable to actually allow or or just like 
acknowledge its existence. I wasn't getting instruction. I wasn't getting instruction sure. on how to decode this. You know? Well, that's the reason why I find it interesting because, like, you know, if you don't have family or friends kind of pushing their agendas on you in any direction. You can be with the most beautiful woman in the world just as a friend. She could be someone who comes into your office every day or someone you see on the street. If you're around her long enough, you're going to hear her fart. She doesn't want to do this in front of you unless she's. Most women don't want to do that in front of someone unless they really know that person really well, that they're a lover or a mate or you know whatever. But even if you're around any casual acquaintance long enough, you're going to hear them pass gas, and it's nasty. You know what I'm saying? And so, in, in, in the same sense, I wasn't being equipped to think about race, you know. And what I was being presented was this idea that is the one most marketed that everything is just and fair and we've had some problems but we're getting past them that's the package and just by living that the untruth of it began to make itself apparent it began to fart 